American Plastic, The Matter of Fiction. The new novel is close to 40 years old. Although 40 is young for an American presidential candidate or a Chinese buried egg, it is very old indeed for a literary movement, particularly a French literary movement. But then what recently has one heard of the new novel, whose official vernissage occurred in 1938 with Natalie Surratt's publication of Tropisms? The answer is not much directly from founders, but a good deal indirectly for, with characteristic torpor, American departments of English have begun slowly to absorb the stern ascetic of Surratt and Rob Grier, not so much through the actual writing of these masters as through their most brilliant interpreter, the witty Metacamp sign master and analyst of Le Degree Zero de la Literature, Roland Bar Bartz whose amused and amusing Saurian face peers like some nearsighted chameleon from the back of a half-dozen slim volumes now being laboriously read in academe. Barthes has also had a significant or signifying effect on a number of American writers, among them Mr. Donald Bartlemy. Two years ago, Mr. Bartlemy was quoted as saying that the only American writers worth reading are John Barth, Grace Paley, William Gass, and Thomas Pynchon. Dutifully, I have read all the writers on Mr. Bartlemy's list, and I presently, and presently I will make my report on them. But first, a look at M. Barthes. For over 20 years, Barthes has been a fascinating high critic who writes with equal verve about Charlie Chaplin, detergents, Marx, toys, Balzac, structuralism, and semiology. He has also put the theory of the new novelist rather better than they have themselves, a considerable achievement si since it is as theoret <laughs> theoreticians and not as practitioners that these writers excel. Unlike Surratt, Rob Grier, and Butor, Professor Barthes is much too clever actually to write novels himself, assuming that such things exist, new or old, full of signs or not, with or without sequential narratives. Rather, Barthes has remained a commentator and a theoretician, and he is often pleasurable to read, though never blissful to appropriate his own terminology. Unlike the weather, theories of the, new, of the novel tend to travel from east to west. But then, as we have always heard, sometimes from the French themselves, the French mind is addicted to the postulating of elaborate systems in order to explain everything, while the Anglo-American mind tends to shy away from unified field theories. We chart our courses point to point. They sight from the stars. The fact that neither really gets much of anywhere doesn't mean that we haven't all had some nice outings over the years. Nine years ago, I wrote an exhaustive and no doubt exhausting account of the theory or theories of the French new novel. Rejected by the American literary paper for which I had written it, subject not all that interesting, I was obliged to publish in England at the CIA's expense. Things have changed since 1967. Today, one can hardly pick up a serious literary review without noting at least one obligatory reference to Barthes, or look at any list of those novelists currently admired by American English departments without realizing that although none of these writers approaches zero degree, quite a few are on the chilly side. This is not such a bad thing. Twice, by the way, I have used the word thing in this paragraph. I grow suspicious, as one ought to be in zero land, of all things and their shadows, words. Barthes's American admirers are particularly fascinated by semiology, a quasi-science of signs first postulated by Ferdinand de Saussure in his Course in General Linguistics, 1916. For some years, the School of Paris and its American Annex have made such of signs and significant in signs and signification, linguistic and otherwise. Barthes's Elements of Semiology, 1964, is a key work and not easy to understand. It is full of graphs and theorems as well as definitions and puzzles. Fortunately, Susan Sontag provides a useful preface to the American edition of Writing Degree Zero, reminding us that Barthes simply takes for granted a great deal that we do not. 
Zero degree writing is that colorless white writing, first defined and named by Sartre in his description of Camus' Le Etrange. It is a language in which, among other things and nothings, metaphor and anthropomorphizing are eliminated. According to Sontag, Barthes is reasonable enough to admit that this kind of writing is but one solution to the disintegration of literary language. As for the semiology, or the science of signs, Barthes concedes that this term, sign, which is found in very different vocabularies, is for these very reasons very ambiguous. He categorizes various uses of the word from the Gospels to the cybernetic to cybernetics. I should like to give him a use of the word he seems not to know. The word for sign in Sanskrit is lingam, which also means phallus, the holy emblem of our Lord Shiva. In SZ 1970, Barthes took Serencine, a Balzac short story, and subjected it to and subjected it to a line by line, even a word by word analysis. In the course of this assault, Barthes makes a distinction between what he calls the readerly text and the writerly text. I am using Mr. Richard Miller's translation of these phrases. Barthes believes that the goal of the literary work or of literature as work is to make the reader no longer a consumer, but a producer of the text. Our literature is characterized by the pitiless divorce between the producer of the text and its user, between its owner and its customer, between its author and its reader. This reader is thereby plunged into a kind of idleness. He is intransitive. He is, in short, serious. Opposite the writerly text, then, is its countervalue, its negative, reactive value. What can be read but not written? The readerly. We call any readerly text a classic text. Then the writerly is the novelistic without the novel, poetry without the poem, but the readerly texts. They are products and not productions. They make up the mass of our literature. How to differentiate this mass once again? Barthes believes that this can be done through interpretation in Nietzschean sense of the word, in the Nietzschean sense of the word. He has a passion incidentally for lizard-like dodges from the direct statement by invoking some great rever reverberating name as an adjective, causing the reader's brow to contract. But then the lunges and dodges are pretty much the matter as well as the manner of Barthes's technique as he goes to work on Balzac's short story of a man who falls in love with a famous Italian singer who turns out to be not the beautiful woman of his dreams, but a castrated Neapolitan boy. I do not intend to deal with Barthes's interpretation of this text, of the text. It is a very elaborate and close reading in a style that seems willfully complicated. I say willfully because the text of itself is a plain and readerly one and no need of this sort of assistance. Not that Barthes wants to assist either text or reader. Rather, he means to make for his own delectation or bliss of a writerly text of his own. I hope that he has succeeded. Like so many of today's academic critics, Barthes resorts to formulas, diagrams, the result, no doubt, of teaching in classrooms equipped with blackboards and chalk. Envious of the half-erased theorems, the uh, prestigious signs of the physicist, English teachers now compete by chalking up theorems and theories of their own. Words have failed them yet again. Fair stood the wind for America. For 20 years from the from the east have come these thoughts, words, signs. Let us now look and see what our own writers have made of so much exciting heavy weather, particularly the writers Mr. Donald Bartolome has named. Do they show signs of the French pox? Two years ago, I read some of Guess, tried and failed to read Bart and Pynchon. I had never read Mr. Bar Bartolome and I had never heard of Grace Haley. I have now made my way through the collected published works of the listed writers as well as through Mr. Bartolme's own enormous output. I was greatly helped in my journey through these texts by Mr. Joe David Bellamy's The New Fiction, a volume containing interviews with most of the principals and their peers. Over the years, I have seen but not read Donald Bartolme's short stories in The, in the New Yorker. I suppose I was put off by the pictures. Bartolome's texts are usually decorated with perspective drawings, ominous faces, funny-looking odds and ends. 
Let the pros do it, I would think severely, and turn the page, looking for S.J. Per Perelman. I was not aware that I was not reading one who is described in the new fiction, as according to Philip Stevick, the most imitative fictionist in the United States today. Mr. Stevick is plainly authority to the interviewer, who then gets Bartle made to say a number of intelligent things about the life of a fictionist today. Mr. Bar Bartle May tells us that his father was a modern architect. Incidentally, it is now the fashion to put quotes around any statement or word that might be challenged. This means that the questionable word or statement was not meant literally, but ironically or ironically. Another way of saying, don't hit me, I didn't mean, I didn't really mean it. As son of a school of Barnstone architect, Bartolome came naturally by those perspective drawings that so annoyed and still annoy me. He has worked as an editor, and I enjoy editing and enjoy doing layout problems of design. I could very cheerfully be a typographer. Bartolome's first book, Come Back, Dr. Caligari, contained short stories written between 1961 and 1964. This was the period during which Surratt and Rob Grier and Barthes were being translated into English, although Rob Grier's For a New Novel was not translated until 1965. Natalie Surratt's Tropisms was translated in 1963, as were such essential novels as Le Planetarium, Fruits d'Or, Jalassi, and Le Voyeur. I note the fact of translation only because Bartle may admits to our common American lack of language. Most American and English writers know foreign literature only through translation. This is bad enough when it comes to literature, but peculiarly dangerous when it comes to theory. One might put the case that without a French education, there is no way of comprehending, say, Roland Barthes. Sontag suggests as much. One can only take a piece here, a piece there, relate it to the tradition that one knows and hope for the best. There is comfort, however, in knowing that the French do not get the point to us either. The stories in Come Back, Dr. Caligari, are fairly random affairs. Bartolome often indulges in a chilling heterosexual camp that is, nevertheless, quite a bit warmer than zero degrees centigrade. There are funny names and cute names. Miss Mandible, numerous non sequiturs. Dialogue in the manner not only of Ionesco, but of Terry Southern, another Texas master. One can read any number of Bartolome's lines with a certain low-keyed pleasure, but then silliness stops the eye cold. You're supposed to be curing a ham. The ham died, she said. The Marx brothers could get a big laugh on this exchange because they would already have given us a do dozen other gags in as many minutes. Unhappily, one small gag on its own shrivels and dies. You may not be interested in absurdity, she said firmly, but absurdity is interested in you. Three years later came Snow White. This fiction was billed by the publisher as a perverse fairy tale. The book is composed of fairly short passages. Quotation marks are used to enclose dialogue, and there are the usual number of he says and she replies. This is an important point. Truly, new writing eliminates quotation marks and he says. Bartolme is still cooking on a warm stove. The seven dwarfs are indistinguishable from one another and from the heroine, but the somewhat plotting tone of this work holds the attention rather better than did any of those fragments in the first volume, yet Bartolme is compelled always to go for the easy twist. Those cruel words remain locked in his lack of heart. Also, he writes about the writing he is writing. Well, we like books that have a lot of dreck in them. Matter which presents itself as not wholly relevant, or indeed at all relevant, but which carefully attended to can supply a kind of sense of what is going on. This kind of sense is not to be obtained by reading between the lines, for there is nothing there in those white spaces but by reading the lines themselves. Roland Barthes, his mark. Unspeakable Practices, Natural Acts, 1968, contains 15 pieces mostly published in the New Yorker. Occasionally, the text is broken with headlines in the Brechtian manner, with film subtitles, with lists. One list called Italian Novel named 16 Italian writers she was reading. Most are fashionable, some are good, but the premier Siaschia has been omitted. What can this mean? Many proper names from real life appear in these texts. Paul Goodman, J.B. Priestley, Julia Ward Howe, Anthony Powell, Goddard. Also, Time, Newsweek, the Museum of Modern Art. 
Curiously enough, those names are, that are already invested within a priori reality help the text, which, as usual, wonder, talking to themselves, keeping a dull eye out for the odd joke as the author tries not to be himself a maker of dreck, but an arranger of dreck. The most successful of the lot is Robert Kennedy, saved from drowning. The reader brings to the story an altogether too vivid memory of the subject. We learn from the interview in Bellamy's book that, though the story is, like, made up, Bartlemy did use a remark that he heard Kennedy make about a geometric painter. Well, at least we know he has a ruler. High wit from Camelot. Yet the parts that are not, like, made up are shrewd and amusing and truthful, relatively, of course. Also, the C. Jane Run style is highly suited to a parody of a contemporary politician on the make as he calculates his inanities inanities, and holds back his truths, relative and relatives too, and rage. Mr. William Gass takes an opposite view of this story. Here, Bartlemy's method fails, for the idea is to use Drek, not write about it. But surely one can do both, or neither, or one, or the other. But then Mr. Gass thinks that Bartlemy is that Bartlemy at his best has the art to make a treasure out of trash. Throughout Bartlemy's work, one notes various homages to the writer or that who lives at Montreux, and where will one hear the ultimate message, drink? Some are a bit too close. For instance, the famous opening scene of Beckett's Malloy, in which a father is carrying his son, becomes a picture of history of the war. Kellerman, gigantic with gin, runs through the park at noon with his naked father slung under one arm. City Life, 1970. Fourteen short stories, much as before, except that now Bartlemy is very deep into fiction's R&D, research and development, as opposed to the old-fashioned R&R, rest and recuperation. There are, galore, graphics. Big black squares occupy the center of white pages. Elaborate studies in perspective. Lots of funny old pictures. There are wide white margins. Nice margins, too. There are pages of questions and answers, Q&A. Father returns. In fact, the first paragraph of the first story is, an aristocrat was riding down the street in his carriage. He ran over my father. It must be said that America's most imitated young writer is also not only the most imitable, but one of the most Im- imitative. Homage to Rob Grier. Or a long sentence moving at a certain pace down the page, aiming for the bottom. If not the bottom of this page, then of some other page where it can rest or stop for a moment to think about the questions raised by its own temporary existence, which ends when the page is turned, or the sentence falls out of the mind that holds it temporarily in some kind of an embrace. And so on. And for eight whole pages, with not one full stop, only a breaking off of the text, which is called sentence. The only development in sentence is that what looks to be Rob Grier at work in the first line turn gradually, temporarily, into something like Raymond Russell. Not quite zero degree. At the frozen pole, no sentence ever thinks or no sentence ever thinks or even thinks. Sadness, 1972. More stories, more graphics. The pictures are getting better all the time. There is a good one of a volcano in eruption. The prose, as before. Simple sentences. Any writer in the country can write a beautiful sentence, Bartolome has declared. But he does not want to be like any writer in the country. I'm very interested in awkwardness. Sentences that are awkward in our in our particular way. What is beauty? One wonders, suspicious of words. What, for that matter, is awkward or particular? But we do know we do know all about sentences and occasionally among the various tributes to European modern masters. Let's see. In translation, certain themes or words reoccur. One is the father, of that more later, also drunkenness. In fact, alcohol runs like a torrent through most of the writers I have been reading. From Bartolome to Pynchon, there is a sense of booziness, nausea, hangover. I say, I'm 40, I have bad eyes, an enlarged liver. That's the alcohol, he says. Yes, I say, you're very much like your father, there. The only pages to hold me were autobiographical. Early dust jacket pictures of Bartolome show an amiable-looking young man upon whose full upper lip there is a slight shadow at the beginning of the lip's bow. 
The dust jacket of sadness shows the bearded man with what appears to be a hair lip. <laughs> Bartleme explains that he has had an operation for basal cell malignancy on his upper lip. True graphics, ultimately, are not old drawings of volcanoes or of perspective, but of the author's actual face on the various dust jackets. Aging in a definitely serial way with, in Bartolome's case, the drama of an operation thrown in. Very much in the r, &R tradition and interesting for the reader, though no doubt traumatizing for the author. Guilty Pleasures, 1974. This writer cannot stop making sentences. I have stopped reading a lot of them. I feel guilty. It is not pleasurable to feel guilty about not reading every one of those sentences. I do like the pictures more and more. In this volume, there are more than 30 pictures. In the prose, I spotted homages to Calvin L. Borges' early Ionesco. I am now saving myself for the dead father, the big one, as they say in the publisher's row. The first big novel, long-awaited, even heralded. In The Pleasure of the Text, published just before The Dead Father and by the same American publisher, Roland Bart Barthes observed, Death of a father would deprive literature of many of its pleasures. If there is no longer a father, why tell stories? Doesn't every narrative lead back to Oedipus? Isn't storytelling always a way of searching for one's origin? As fiction, Oedipus was at least good for something to make good novels. Apparently, Bartolome took the hint. In The Dead Father, a number of people are lugging about the huge remains of something called The Dead Father. Only this monster is not very dead, because he talks quite a bit. The people want to bury him, but he is not all that eager to be buried. Bartolome ends his book by deliberately burying the eponymous hero, and perhaps fiction too. All of this is very ambitious. Bartolome's narrative is reasonably sequential, if lacking in urgency. There is, as always, Beckett. Said Julie, let us proceed. They proceeded. Within the book is a manual for sons, written in a splendid run-on style, quite at odds with the most imitated, imitable writing that surrounds Z, this unexpectedly fine burst of good writing on the nature of father's sons. For the record, there are no quotation marks and no pictures. There is one diagram of a placement, but it is not much fun. I am not sure that my progress through all these dull little sentences has been entirely justified by a manual for sons, but there is no doubt that beneath the, the mannerisms, the infantile chic, the ill-digested culture of an alien world, Bartolome does have a talent for, of all things, in this era, writing. Shall I quote an example? I think not. Meanwhile, Bartolome himself says, I have trouble reading in these days. I would rather drink, talk, or listen to music. I now listen to rock constantly. Yes. I can only assume that Grace Paley is a friend of Mr. Bartolome because she does not belong to what a certain hack of academe named Harry T. Moore likes mistakenly to call a galere. Paley is a plain short story writer of the R&R &R school, and I got a good deal of pleasure from reading her two collections of short stories, The Little Disturbances of Man, with the nice subtitle Stories of Men and Women at Love, and Enormous Changes at the Last Minute. She works from something very like life. I mean, life. She has an extraordinary ear for the way people sound. She do the ethics. <laughs> she do the ethics in different voices. Oh God, Lord. Although she tends at times to the plain Jane or C. Jane Run kind of writing, her prose has such a natural energy that one is not distracted. A good sign of writing, if not a blissful text. She is close to boiling. In any case, she and will never freeze. With William Gass, we are back in R&D country. I read Gass's first novel, um, Omen's Letter, Omen Setter's Luck, in 1966 and found much to admire in it. Gass's essays are often eerily good. At his best, he can inhabit a subject in a way that no other critic now writing can do. See, in particular, his commentaries on Gertrude Stein. He seems not to have enjoyed being interviewed in Bellamy's collection, and his tone is unusually truculent. Of New York quality lit types, I snub them. It should be noted that of the writers admired by Bartolme, only William Gass is an intellectual in the usual sense. I put no quotes around the words intellectual, usual, or sense. Gass's mind is not only first rate, but far too complex to settle for the easy effects of, say, Mr. Mr. Bartolme. But then, as a student of philosophy, 
I've put a, in a great deal of time on the nature of language and belong rather vaguely to a school of linguistic philosophy, which is extremely skeptical about the nature of language itself. Gass has a complaint about Barth, Borges, and Beckett. Occasionally, their fictions conceived as establishing a metaphorical relationship between the reader and the world they are creating lead the reader to passive. This is fair comment, though open to the question just what is passive in this context? Ought the reader to be dancing about the room, blood pressure elevated, adrenaline flowing as he and the text battle one another? One another? But then gas, gas shifts ground in his next sentence but one. I have little patience with the creative reader. In other words, the ideal reader is active but not creative. Quotation marks are now in order to protect these adjectives from becoming meaningless. I rarely read fiction and generally don't enjoy it. Gas is as one with the R&D writers of fiction today. Although they do not read with any pleasure what anyone else is doing, they would like, naturally, to be themselves read with pleasure. By whom? Perhaps the college of writerly texts grave as, grave as cardinals. Gass himself is a curious case. Essentially, he is, a, he is a traditional prose writer capable of all sorts of virtuoso effects on the inner ear as well as on the reading eye. Yet he appears to have fallen victim to the R&D mentality. Speaking of a work in progress, I hope that it will be really original in form and in effect, although mere, mere originality is not what I'm after. This is worthy of Jimmy Carter. Fiction had traditionally and char characteristically borrowed its form from letters, journals, diaries, autobiographies, histories, travelogues, news stories, backyard gossip, etc. It has simply pretended to be one or one or other of them. The history of fiction is in part a record of the efforts of its authors to create for fiction in its own forms. Poetry has its own. It didn't borrow from the ode from somebody. Now the novel is imagined news, imagined psychological or sociological case studies, imagined history, feigned, I should say, not imagined. As Rilke shattered the journal form with Malt and Joyce created his own for Ulysses and Finnegan, I should like to create mine. There seems to me to be a good deal wrong not only logically, but aesthetically and historically with this analysis. First, poetry has never had its form. The origins of the ode are ancient, but it was once created, if not by a single ambitious school teacher, then by a number of poets roving like Terence's rose down the centuries. Certainly in this century, poetry has gone off as, in as many directions as the, as the novel, an art form whose tutelary deity is Proteus. The more like something else the novel is, the more like its true self it is. And since we do not have it, we cannot go on making it. Finally, whether or not a work of art is feigned or imagined is irrelevant if the art is good. Like many good books, Omen Setter's luck is not easy, easy to describe. What one comes away with is the agreeable memory of a flow of language that ranges from demotic Midwest, I just up and screams at him, thump, thump, thump. He'd been going, die, die, die. I yell to incantatory, for knowledge, good or, for good or evil, would Eve had set her will against her father's. Ah, Horatio. In his interview, the author tells us that he knows nothing of the setting in Ohio River Town, that everything is made up. He also confesses, I haven't the dramatic imagination at all. Even my characters tend to run to, even my characters tend to turn away from one another and talk to the void. This, along with my inability to narrate, is my most serious defect, I think, as a writer and incidentally as a person. The stories in, in the heart of the heart of the country seem to me to be more adventurous and often more successful than the novel. The Pedersen Kid is a beautiful work. Is beautiful work. In a curious way, the look of those short sentences on pages uncluttered with quotation marks gives the text a visual purity and coldness that perfectly complements the subject of the story and compels the reader to know the icy winter at the country's heart. In most of these stories, the prevailing image is winter. Billy closes his door and carries coal or wood to his fire and closes, closes his eyes, and there's simply no way of knowing how lonely and empty he is or whether he's as vacant and barren and loveless as the rest of us are here in the heart of the country. At actual zero degree, gas perversely blazes with energy. The title story is the most interesting of the collection. 
Despite a sign or two that the French virus may have struck, as I write this page, it is 11 days since I have seen the sun. The whole of the story told in fragments is a satisfying description of the world the narrator finds himself in, and he makes art of the quotidian. My window is a grave, and all that lies within it's dead. No snow is falling. There's no haze. It's not still, not silent. Its images are not an animal that waits, for movement is no de demonstration. What is art? Art is energy shaped by intelligence. The energy that the text of Madame Bovary generates for the right reader is equal to that which sustains the consumer of Rebecca. The ordering intelligence of each writer is, of course, different in kind and intention. Gas's problem as an artist is not so much his inability to come up with some brand new Henry Ford type invention that will prove to be a breakthrough in world fiction. This is never going to happen. As what he calls his weak point, a lack of dramatic gift, which is nothing more than low or rather intermittent energy. He can write a dozen passages in which the words pile up without effect. Then, suddenly, the current, as it were, turns on again, and the text comes to beautiful life. In a matter of speaking, of course, who does not like a living novel, particularly one that is literate? I have seen the sea slack, life bubble through a body without a trace, its spheres impervious as sodas. For a dozen years, I have been trying to read The Sotweed Factor. I have never entirely completed this astonishing astonishingly dull book, but I have read most of John Barr's published work, and I feel that I have done him, I hope, justice. There is a black cloth on my head as I write. First, it should be noted that Barth, like Gass, is a professional school teacher. He is a professor of English and creative writing. He is extremely knowledgeable about what is going on in R&D land, and he is certainly eager to make his contribution. Interviewed, Barth notes the inescapable fact that literature, because it's made of the common stuff of language, seems more refractory to change in general than the other arts. He makes the obligatory reference to the music of John Cage. Then he adds sensibly that the permanent change in, changes in fiction from generation to generation more often have been and are more likely to be modifications of sensibility and attitude rather than dramatic innovations in form and technique. Barth mentions his own favorite writers, apparently Borges, Beckett, and Nabokov, among the living grain masters and writers like Italio Cavino, Rob Grier, John Hawks, William Gass, Donald Bartle may have experimented with form and technique and even with the means of fiction, working with graphics and tapes and things. What these writers have in common, except Rob Grier, is a more or less fantastical, or as Borges would say, a realist view of reality. Barth thinks, hopes, that this sort of writing will characterize the 70s. What is irrealism? Something that cannot be realized. This is, the, is a curious goal for a writer, though it is by no means an unfamiliar terminus for many an ambitious work. Further, Barth believes that realism is a kind of aberration in the history of literature. I am not exactly sure what he means by realism. After all, the Greek myths that he likes to play around with were once a reality to those who used them as stuff for narrative. But then Barth broods, perhaps we should accept that the fact that writing and reading are essentially linear activities and devote our attention as writers to those aspects of experience that can best be rendered linear, linearly, linearly, <laughs> with words that go left to right across the page, subjects, verbs, and objects, punctuation, he ends with the rather plaintive, the trick, I guess, in any of the arts at this hour of the world is to have it both ways. How true. The Floating Opera, 1956, and The End of the Road, 1958, are two novels of a kind that... <laughs> are two novels of a kind, and that kind is strictly R&R, &R, and fair, fairly superior R&R &R at that. The author tells us that they were written in his 24th year, and a good year it was for him. Publishers meddled with the ending of his first novel. He has since revised the book, and that is the version I read. It is written in the first person, demotic, eastern shore of Maryland, birth place of origin. The style is garrulous, but not unattractive. I was just 37 then, and as was my practice, I greeted the new day with a slug of Sherbrooke from the court of my windowsill. 
I have a court sitting there now, but it's not the same one. There is a tendency to put too much in, recalling verses, the prattle of meaning, SZ, certain storytellers. Impose a dense plenitude of meaning, or if one prefers, a certain redundancy, a kind of semantic prattle typical of the archaic or infantile era of modern discourse, marked by the excessive fear of failing to communicate meaning its basis, while in reaction in our latest or new novels. The action or event is set forth without accompanying it with its signification. Certainly, Barth began an old, as an old-fashioned writer who wanted us to know all about the adulteries, money hassling, and boozing on what sounded like a very real eastern shore of a very real Maryland. As lacking in bears as the seacoast of Il Illyria, Charlie was Charlie Parks, an attorney whose office was next door to ours. He was an old friend and poker partner of mine, and currently we were on opposite sides in a complicated litigation. In 1960, Barth published The Sotweed Factor. The paperback edition is adorned with the following quotation from the New York Times Book Review. Outrageously funny, villainously slanderous. The book is a brass-knuckled satire of humanity at large. I am usually quick, even eager, to respond to the outrageously funny, the villainously slanderous, in short, to the New York Times itself. But as I read on and on, I could not so much as summon up a smile at the lazy jokes and the horrendous pastiche of what Barth takes to be 18th century English. Tis not that which distresses me, tis Andrew's notion that I had vicious designs on the girl. Shart, if anything be improbable, tis. I stopped at page 412 with 407 pages to go. The sentences would not stop unfurling, as Peter Hankid puts it in Caspar. Every sentence helps you along. You get over every object with a sentence. A sentence helps you get over an object when you can't really get over it, so that you really get over it, etc. To read Barth on the subject of his own work and then to read the work itself is a puzzling business. He talks a good deal of sense. He is obviously intelligent, yet he tells us that when he turned from the R&R &R of his first two novels to the megalo R&R &R of the Sotweed Factor, he moved from a merely comic mode to a variety of farce, which frees your hands even more than comedy, comedy does. Certainly there are more comic there are comic aspects to the first two books but the ponderous jocosity of the third book is neither farce nor satire nor much of anything except english teacher writing at a pretty low level i can only assume that the book's admirer admirers are as ignorant of the 18th century as the author or to be fair the author's imagination and that neither author nor admiring reader has a sense of humor a fact duly noted about americans in general and their serious ponderous novelists in particular by many peoples in other lands. It still takes a lot of civilization gone slightly high to make a wit. Giles, Giles's Goat Boy arrived on the scene in 1966, another 800 pages of ambitious school teacher writing. A book to be taught rather than read, I shall not try to encapsulate it here, other than to say that the central metaphor is the universe is the university is the universe. I suspect that this will prove to be one of the essential American university novels, and to dismiss it is to dismiss those departments of English that have made such a book possible. The writing is more than usually clumsy. A verse play has been included. Agnora. For Pete's sake, simmer down, boys. Don't you think I have been a dean's wife long enough to stink my public image up? Barth thinks that the word human is a noun. He also thinks that Giles pronounced with a hard G as in guile instead of a soft G as in giant. But then the unlearned learned teachers of English are the new barbarians, serenely restoring the Dark Ages. By 1968, Barth was responding to the French new novel Lost in the Fun House is the result. A collection, or as he calls it, a series of fiction for print, tape, live, live voice, Barth is not about to miss a trick now that he has moved into R&D country. The first of the series, Night Sea Journey, should or could be on tape. This is the first person narrative of a sperm heading, it would appear, toward an ovum, though some of its es eschatological musings might suggest that a blowjob may be in progress. Woody Allen has dealt more rigorously with this theme. The story lost in the funhouse is merely is most writerly and self-conscious. It chats with the author who, chart who chats with it and with us. Description of physical appearance and mannerisms is one of the is one of several standard methods of characteriz characterization 
used by writers of fiction. Thus, Barth distances the reader from the text. A boy goes to the funhouse and, the more closely an author identifies with the narrator, literally or metaphorically, the less advisable it is, as a rule, to use first-person narrative viewpoint. Some of this school teacherly commentary is amusing, but the ultimate effect is one of an ambitious but somewhat uneasy writer out to do something brand new in a territory already inhabited by, among other texts, that can be read and write the sinister Lucas Solis, the immortal Thluth, and the dexterous Anesta Ninnies. It is seldom wise for a born R and R writer to make himself over into an R and D writer, unless he has something truly formidable and new to show us. Barth just has books and sentences and a fairly clear idea or of just how far up the creek he is without a paddle. I believe literature is not likely ever to manage abstraction successfully, like sculpture, for example. Is that a fact? What a time to bring up that subject! What a time, and what a subject it is, and what is the subject, Alice? Incidentally, Barth always uses quotation marks, and he says, In 1972, Barth published three long stories in a volume called Chimera. Two of the stories are based on Greek myths, for they are not, as admirers of Young declare, part of the racial memory, the common stock of all our dreams and narratives. Well, no, they are not. The Greek, the Greek myths are are just barely relevant to those Mediterranean people who still live in a landscape where the anima of the, a lost world has not yet been entirely covered with cement. The myths are useful but not essential to those brought up on those, class, those classics, the generation to which Dr. Young and T.S. Eliot belonged. And of course, they are necessary to anyone who would like to understand those works of literature in which myth plays, are a, par myth plays a part. Otherwise, they are of no real use to Americans born in this century. For us, Oedip for us, Oedipus is not the doomed king of Thebes, but Dr. Freud's depressing protagonist, who bears no relation at all to the numinous figure that Sophocles and Euripides portrayed. Thebes is another country where we may not dwell. Joyce's Ulysses is often regarded as a successful attempt to use Greek myth to shore up a contemporary narrative, but it is plain to most non-creative readers that the myth does not work at all in Joyce's creation, and were it not for his glorious blarney and fine naturalistic gifts, the book's classical structure alone could not have supported the novel. Since Joyce, alas, the incorporation of Greek myth into modern narrative has been irresistible to those who have difficulty composing narrative and know Greek. These ambitious writers simply want to give unearned resonance to their tales of adultery on the eastern shore of Maryland, of misbehavior in faculty rooms, of massive occlusions in the heart of the country. But the results are deeply irritating to those who have some sense of, class of the classical world and puzzling, I would think, to those taking English courses where the novel is supposed to have started with Richardson. Barth has browsed through Robert Graves's The Greek Myths and gives due acknowledgement to that brilliantly eccentric custodian of the old world. At random, I would guess, Barth selected the story of Beller Bellerophon, tamer of Pegasus, for modernizing. Also, more to his point, Perseus, the slayer of Medusa. The first story is taken from Arabian mythology, a narrative called <laughs> Dunya Zidiyad, as told by the kid sister of S.C. S-C-H-E-H-E-R-A-Z-A-D-E. -E -E. It should also be noted that the two stories in the last of in the lost in okay. it should also be noted that two of the stories in Lost in the Funhouse were wacky versions of certain well-known hijinks in old Mycenae. Mycenae. The kid sister of S is a Gabby is a Gabby coed who mentions with awe the academic gifts of her sister Sherry, an undergraduate arts and sciences major at Banu Sassan University. Besides, being homecoming queen, valedictorian elect, and a four-letter varsity athlete, every graduate department in the East was after her with fellowships. This unbearable cuteness has a sinister side. Since Barth's experience of literature in the world is entirely that of a school teacher, he appears to take it for granted that the prevailing metaphor for his own life, and why not all life itself, is the university. There is also an underlying acceptance of the fact that since no one is ever going to read him except undergraduates in, America, in American universities, he had better take into account that their reading skills are somewhat underdeveloped, their knowledge of the way society works vague, and their culture thin. 
Bart's Hamlet would no doubt begin, well, I guess flunking out of Rutgers is no big deal when I got this family up in Wilmington where we make these plastics that, like, kill people, but I'm changing all that, or I was going up, going to, up, I was going to up until my mother went and married this asshole uncle of mine. Perhaps this is the only way to get the classics into young television shrunk minds, but the exercise debases both classics and young, man, young minds. Of course, Barth is no fool. He is often quick to jump in and forestall criticism. Sherry's kid sister remarks, Currently, however, the only readers of artful, fi artful fiction are critics, other writers, and un unwilling students who left to themselves preferred music and pictures to words. Sherry has helped in her literary efforts to think up a thousand and one stories by Jeannie, who is, like so many of Barth's male protagonists, a thoroughly good person. His policy was to share beds with no woman who did not reciprocate his feelings. For a United Statesman posing as an Arabian genie, this is true heterosexual maturity. In case we miss Barth's first testimonial to the genie's niceness, we are later told that he was no more tempted to infidelity than to in incest or pederasty. I guess this makes him about the best genie on campus. Between genie and Sherry, there is a lot to talk about the nature of fiction, which is, of course, the only reason for writing university fiction. There is not a glimmer of intelligence in this jaunty tale. Barth was born and grew up a, a traditional cracker barrel sort of American writer, very much in the mainstream, a stream by no means polluted or t at an end, but he chose not to continue in the vein that was most natural to him. Obviously, he has read a good deal about novel theory. He has a standard American passion not only to be original, but to be great, and this means creating one of Richard Poirier's worlds elsewhere, an alternative imaginative structure to the mess that we have made of our portion of the Western Hemisphere. Aware of the French theories about literature, but ignorant of the culture that has produced those theories, superficially acquainted with Greek myth, deeply involved in the academic life of the American university, Barth is exactly the sort of writer our departments of English were bound, sooner or later, to produce. Since he is a writer with no great gift for language, either demotic or man Mandarin, Barth's narratives tend to lack energy, and the currently fashionable technique of stopping to take a look at the story as it is being told simply draws attention to the me meagerness of what is what is there. I am obliged to remark upon the sense of suffocation one's experiences reading so much so much bad writing. As the weary eyes flick from sentence to sentence, one starts willing the author to be good. Either I have become shell-shocked by overexposure to the rocket's red glare and bombs bursting in the air, or Barth has managed a decent narrative in Perseid. As usual, the language is jangling everyday speech. Just then, I'd have swapped my scene for a cold drought and a spot of shade to dip in. The gods and demigods are straight from Thorne Smith, who ought to be regarded in, in Harry T. Moore's Galere as the American Dante. But the story of a middle-aged Perseus and his problems of erection and love with a young girl seems at times authentic, even true, despite Barth's unremitting jocosity. Were you always psychosexually weak, or is that Andromeda's doing? In some ways, the writers' interviews are more revealing about the state of fiction than the books they write. The 12 writers interviewed for Joe David Bellamy's book often sound truculent, also uneasy. For, an in for instance, John Gardner, whose Grendel I much admired, is very truculent. But then Mr. Bartlemy is on record as not admiring him. This cannot help but hurt. Gardner is as much his own man as anyone can be who teaches school and wants to get good reviews from his fellow teachers in the New York Times book review. Yet he dares to say the Sotweed factor, nothing but a big joke. It's a, philosoph it's a philosophical joke. It might even be argued that it's a philosophical advance, but it ain't like Victor Hugo. It also ain't an advance of any kind, although Gardner is myth-minded. He is much more intuitive and authentic than the usual academic browser in Robert Graves' compendium. Gardner also knows where proto-myths are to be found, Walt Disney's work for one. Gardner tells us that most writers today are acad academic shins. <laughs> they have writing or teaching jobs with universities. In the last 10 years, the tone of un university life and of intellectuals' responses to the world have changed. 
During the Cold War, there was a great deal of fear and cynicism on account of the bomb. Gardner then makes the astonishing suggestion that when the other Americans, though somewhat unreal millions condemned to live off campus, turned against the Vietnam War after eight years of defeat, the mood changed in the universities as the academicians realized that the people around you are all working hard to make the world better. A startling observation. In any case, the writers of university or U novels will now become more life-affirming than they were in the sad 60s. Notable exceptions are writers who very carefully stay out of the mainstream and therefore can't be influenced by the general feeling of the people around of people around them. At first, I thought Gardner was joking, but I was wrong. He really believes that the mainstream of the world is the American university and that a writer outside this warm and social meliorizing ambience will fall prey to old-fashioned cynicism and hardness of heart. For instance, Pynchon stays out of universities. He doesn't know what chemists and physicists are doing. He knows only the pedantry of chemistry and physics. When good chemists and phys physicists talk about, say, the possibility of extraterrestrial life, they agree that for life to be evolved beyond our stage, creators on other planets must have reached decisions we now face. Removed from the academic mainstream and its extraterrestrial connections, Pynchon's gravity's rainbow is just an uh, um, apocalyptic wine. Fortunately, Gardner's imagination is fabulous. Otherwise, he would be fully exposed in his work as being not only not in the mainstream of American society, but perfectly irrelevant in his academic cul-de-sac. Yet if he is if he is right that most contemporary writers are also teaching school and listening in, in on warm-hearted life-enhancing physicists and chemists as they often talk of their peers on other planets, then literature has indeed had its day, and there will be no more books except those who those that teach those that teachers write to teach. Although Bartlemy has mentioned Pynchon as one of the writers he admires, neither Gas nor Barth refers to him, and Gardner thinks of him a whiner because he no longer spawns in the mainstream of academe. I dare say that it will come as news to these relatively young writers that American literature, such as it is, has never been the work of school teachers. Admittedly, each year it is harder and harder for a writer to make a living from writing, and many writers must find the temptation to teach overwhelming. Nevertheless, those of us who emerged in the 40s, Roosevelt's children, regarded the university as did our predecessors as a kind of skid row far worse than a seven-year writer's contract at Columbia, the studio, not the university. Except for Saul Bellow, I can think of no important novelist who has taught on a regular basis throughout a career. I find it admirable that of the non non-academics, Pynchon did not follow the usual lazy course of going for tenure, as did so many writers, no, writers, of his generations. He is 39 years old and attended Cornell, took a class from former Professor V. Nabokov. Nabokov. He is eminently academical. <laughs> the fact that he has got out into the world somewhere to is to his credit. Certainly he has not, it would seem, missed a trick, and he never whines. Pynchon's first novel, V, was published in 1963. There is some similarity to other R&D works. Cute names abound. Benny Profane, Dewey Gland, Rachel Owlglass. Booze flows through scene after scene involving members of a gang known as the Whole Sick Crew. The writing is standard American. Kilroy was possibly the only object objective onlooker in Valletta that night. Common legend had it he'd been born in the U.S. right before the war on a fence or a latrine wall. Above this pas passage is a reproduction of the classic Kilroy sketch. Below this passage, there is a broken line Kilroy. These are only the graphics in a long book that can also contains the usual quotation marks and he says, all in all, a naturalistic rendering of an essentially surrealistic or perhaps irrealistic subject, depending on one's apprehension of the work. Benny Profane is, is described as a schlemiel and human yo-yo. He is a former sailor. On Christmas Eve 1955, he is in Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia. He goes into a bar, his old tin cans tavern on East Main Street. People with funny names sing songs at each other. Lyrics provided in full by author, and everyone drinks a lot. There is vomiting. Same with the girl. What sort of Catholic was she? 
profane, who was only half Catholic, mother Jewish, whose morality was fragmentary, being derived from experience and not much of it. Profane is girl shy and fat. If I was God, begins a fantasy. Definitely a clue to the state of mind of the creator of the three books I have been reading. A shift from profane to young stencil, the world adventurer. In the Mystery Woman v. Elliptical, Conversation 1946, between a Margravine and Stencil, whose father, Sidney, was in the British Foreign Office, he died in Malta, while investigating the June disturbances. They sit on a terrace overlooking the Mediterranean. Perhaps they may have felt like the last two gods. Reference to an entry in Father's Journal. There is more behind and inside V than any of us had suspected. Not who, but what, what is she? Stencil pursues the idea of V, a quest, in the tradition of the Golden Bough or the White Goddess. From various references to Henry Adams and to ph uh, physics in Pynchon's work, I take it that he has been influenced by Henry Adams' theory of history as set forth in the education of Henry Adams, and in the posthumously published The Rule of Phase Applied to History. For Adams, a given human society and time was an organism like any other in the universe, and he favored Clausius's speculation that the entropy of the universe tends to be tends to a maximum. An early Pynchon short story is called Entropy. Maximum entropy is that state at which no heat energy enters or leaves a given system, but nothing known as constant. The second law of thermodynamics appears to be absolute. Everything in time loses energy to something else and finally drops to zero centigrade, centigrade and dies or perhaps ceases to matter as it was and becomes antimatter. Question. To antimatter, are we anti-antimatter or no matter at all? I have little competence in the other of Lord Snow's celebrated two cultures. Like so many other writers, I flunked physics, but I know my atoms and I can grasp sent I can grasp general principles without understanding how they have been arrived at. In any case, to make literature a small amount of theory is enough to provide commanding metaphors. Pynchon's use of physics is exhilarating, and as an artist, he appears to be gaining more energy than he is losing. Unlike the zero writers, he is usually at the boil. From Adams, he has not only appropriated the image of history as dynamo, but the attractive image of the virgin. Now armed with these concepts, he embarks in V on a quest, a classic form of narrative, and the result is mixed, to say the least. To my ear, the prose is pretty bad, full of all the rattle and buzz that were in the air when the author was growing up, an era in which only the television commercial was demonically acquiring, acquiring energy, leaked to it by a declining Western civilization. Happily, Pynchon is unaffected by the French disease except for one passage. Let me describe the room. The room measures 17 by 11 and a half feet by 7 feet. The walls are lathe and plaster. The room is oriented so that its di diagonals fall north northeast, south southwest, and northwest by southeast. As another ex seaman, I appreciate Pynchon's ability to box the compass, something no French ice cream vendor could ever do. With this satisfying send up, Pynchon abandons the new novel for his own words in anti worlds. The quest for V, the Virgin, or nothing much, takes stencil to Valletta, the capital of Malta, a matriarchal island, we are told, where manhood must identify itself with a massive rock. There are clues. False sense. Faust is on the scene, and Profane is also in Malta. The prose is very close to that of the comic book of the 50s. Thirteen of us rule the world in secret. Yes, yes, Stencil went out of his way to bring Profane here. He should have been more careful. He wasn't. Is it really his own extermination he's after? Majustro turned smiling to him, gestured behind his back at the ramparts of Valletta. Ask her, he whispered. Ask the rock. Energy nicely maintain, maintained, controlling intelligence uneven. With the crying of light, 49, 1966, Pynchon returns to the quest to conspiracy. Cute names like Genghis Cohen, an ancient Hollywood joke. Bad grammars. San Narcisco lay further south. Some whirlwind rotating too slow for her heated skin. A lot of booze. Homophobia mysteries. Homophobia mysteries. It would appear that most of the courses a Pynchon took at Cornell are being used. First year physics psychology, Jacobian tragedy, but then his art is no doubt derived from experience and not much of that. 
This time, the Grail is an alternative postal service. Haunting the narrative is the noble house of Thurn and Taxis, the wife of a, a descendant was a literary agent in the United States, known to Pynchon. Also, Rilke's patroness was a princess of that house. Jokes. I was in the little boy's room, he said. The men's room was full. There are numerous images of paranoia. The lurking they who dominate the phantom postal service of the Tristero, sometimes spelled Tristero, a mere alternative in early times to the Thurn and Taxi's postal monopoly. While the Pony Express is defying deserts, savages, and side Winders, Tristero is giving its employees crash courses in Siouan and Athapaskan dialects. Disguised as Indians and their, their messengers mosey westward. Reach the coast every time, zero attrition rate, not a scratch on them. The entire emphasis now towards silence, impersonation, opposition, masquerading as allegiance. Well, Joyce also chose exile, cunning, silence, but eschewed allegiance's mask. Lot 49 has been cried. Who will bid? Gravity's Rainbow 1973 contains close to 900 densely printed pages. For a year, I've, I have been reading in and at the, at the text. Naturally, I am impressed that a clear-cut majority of the departments of English throughout North America believe this to be the perfect teacher's novel. I am sure that they are right. Certainly no young writer's book has been so praised since Colin Wilson's The Outsider. The first, sentence, the first section of Gravity's Rainbow is called Beyond the Zero, plainly a challenge not only to la cure blanche to, put, to proud entropy itself. Pynchon has now aimed himself at antimatter, at what takes place beyond, beneath the zero of freezing and death. This is superbly ambitious, and throughout the text energy hums like a, well, dynamo. The narrative begins during the Second War in London. Although Pynchon works hard for verisimilitude and fills his pages with period jabber, anachronisms occasionally jar. There were no Skinnerites in that happy time of mass death. The controlling image is that of V-2, a guided missile developed by the Germans and used toward the end of the war. Has Pynchon finally found V? And is she a bomb? There is an interesting epigraph from Werner von Braun. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Braun believes in the community of our spiritual existence after death. So much then for zero degree. This quasi-Hindu sentiment is beguiling and comforting, and no doubt, as concerns matter, true. In time or phases, energy is always lost, but matter continues in new arrangements. Personally, I find it somber indeed to think that individual personality goes on and on beyond zero time. Beyond zero time. But I am in the minority. This generation of Americans is God-hungry and craves reassurance of personal immortality. If Pynchon can provide it, he will be a, as he will be as a god. Rather, his intention, I would guess. It is curious to read a work that excites the imagination but disturbs the aesthetic sense. A British critic, no longer in fashion, recently made the entirely unfashionable observation that prose has everywhere declined in quality as a result of mass education. To compare Pynchon with Joyce, say, is to compare a kindergartner to a graduate student. The permanent majority of the culturally inadequate will promptly respond that the kindergartner sees more clearly than the graduate student, and that his inco incompetence with language is a sign of innocence, not ignorance, and hence grace. Pynchon's prose rattles on and on, broken by occasional lengthy songs every bit as bad lyrically as those of Bob Dylan. Light up and shine, you incandescent bulb babies. Looks like you got rabies. Just lay there foaming and uh, screaming like a bunch of little demons. I'm delivering unto you kingdom of roaches. England, Germany, past, present, war, science. Telltale images of approaching deity. Two characters with hangovers or wasted gods urging on a tardy glacier. Of sandbags at a door. Provisional pyramids erected to gratify curious gods' offspring and slicks of nighttime vomit, pale yellow, clear as the fluids of gods. Under deity, sex is central to this work of transformation. A character's erections achieve a mysterious symbiosis with the V20 or the V2S. The sadist abuses a young man and woman. Every true god must be both organizer and destroyer. The character declaims, 
If only S and M could be established universal universally at a family level, the state would wither away. This is a nice joke, although I thought S and M was already universal at the family level. Submit, Gottfried. Give it all up. See where she takes you. Think of the first time I fucked you, you little <laughs> rosebud bloomed. Hard to believe that it is close to a decade since that pretty mossy rose was first forced, as it were, in my greenhouse. Eventually, the text exhausts patience and energy. In fact, I suspect that the energy expended in reading Gravity's Rainbow is, for anyone, rather greater than that expended by pension in the actual writing. This is entropy with a vengeance. The writer's text is ablaze with the heat energy that his readers have lost to him. Yet the result of this exchange is neither a readerly nor a writerly text, but an in uneasy combination of both. Energy and intelligence are not in balance and the writer fails in his ambition to be a god of creation. Yet his ambition and his failure are very much in the cranky, solipsistic American vein. And though I doubt if anyone will ever want to read all of this book, it will certainly be taught for a very long delta time. Approaching zero, eternally approaching, the slices of time growing thinner and thinner, a succession of rooms with walls more silver transparent as the pure light of the zero comes nearer. Everything is running down. We shall freeze. Then what? A film by Stanley Kubrick? Richard Poirier is more satisfied than I with Pynchon's latest work. For one thing, he is awed by the use of science. Approvingly, he quotes Wordsworth's hope that the poet would one day be ready to follow the steps of the man of science, not only in those general indirect effects, but he will be at his side carrying sensation into the midst of science itself. Pynchon would appear to fulfill Wordsworth's reverie. He is as immersed in contemporary physics and cybernetics as Henry Adams was in the scientific theories of his day. But the scientific aspects of Pynchon's work will eventually become as out of date as those of Henry Adams. Science changes. One day we are monis, monis. The next day we are pluralists. Proofs are always being disproven by other proofs. At the end, there are only words in their arrangement. Point... Poirier compares Pynchon to the Faulkner of Absalom Absalom and finds both likeness and a significant difference for this genius of our day is shaped by thermodynamics in the media, by Captain Marvel rather than by Colonel Sartoris. There is no doubt a true description <laughs> there is no doubt a true description, but is the result as good or good? What I find to be tedious and random in Pynchon's list-making, Poirier sees as so many Dreiserian catalogs of the waste materials of our world that only by remaining resolutely on the periphery without ever intruding himself into the plotting that emanates from his material, only then can he see what most humanly matters. Matter. A verb. Matter. A noun. The matter of fiction has been expanded by Pynchon's ascent from zero degree writing as well as centigrade. Nevertheless, entropy is sovereign. That which gains energy heat does so at the expense of that which is losing energy heat to it. At the end, there is only the cold and no sublunary, sub, sublunary creatures will ever know what songs the quasars sing in their dark pits of antimatter. I cannot help but feel a certain depression after reading Mr. Barclay's Chosen Writers. I realize that language changes from generation to generation, but it does not necessarily improve. The meager rattling prose of all these writers accepting gas depresses me. Beautiful sentences are not easy to write, despite Mr. Bartolomé's demure. Since beauty is relative only to intention, there are doubtless those who find beauty in the pages of books where I find a flocculent appearance, something opaque, creamy and curdled, something powerless, ever to achieve the triumphant triumphant smoothness of nature. But what best reveals it for what it is is the sound it gives. At once hollow and flat, its noise is its undoing, as are its colors, for it seems capable of retaining only the most chemical-looking ones. Of yellow, red, and green, it keeps only the aggressive quality. What is it? The work of the new American formalists? No. It is is plastic, as described by Barthes in Mythologies. The division between what I have elsewhere called the public novel and the university novel is now too great to be bridged by any but the occasional writer who is able to appeal. First one 
first to one side, then to the other, fulfilling the expectations more or less of each. I find it hard to take seriously the novel that is written to be taught, nor can I see how the American university can provide a base for the making of new writing when the American university is at best culturally and intellectually conservative and at worst reactionary. Academics tell me that I am wrong. They assure me that if it were not for them, the young would never read the public novels of even the recent past, Faulkner, Fitzgerald. If this is true, then I would prefer for these works decently to die rather than to become teaching tools, artifacts stinking of formaldehyde in a classroom, original annotated text with six essays by the author and eight critical articles examining the parameters of the author's vision. But the academic bureaucracy, unlike the novel, will not wither away, and the future is dark for literature. Certainly the young in general are not going to take up reading when they have such easy alternatives as television movies rock. The occasional student who might have an interest in reading will not survive it, of course, in English, unless, of course, he himself intends to become an academic bureaucrat. As for Thomas Pynchon, one can applaud his deliberate ascent from academe into that dangerous rainbow sky in which he will make his parabola and fall as gravity pulls him back to where he started, to academe to zero, or to my first paragraph ever. The New York Review of Books, July 15, 1974.